Good morning, family. Let's take a moment and breathe God in to welcome whatever we need that God wishes to give in this moment. Just take a moment. Amen. So our scripture this morning comes from Deuteronomy 34, 1 through 5, and it reads as follows. Then Moses went up to the plains of Moab, to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead, as far as Dan and Nephtali, and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, and the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, this is the land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the command of the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. So there have been dark times in my life when I know it was the prayers of others, mostly elders in my family or in life, but also friends and community who prayed me through times when I felt paralyzed by pain and couldn't pray. And this isn't an odd occurrence, right? We used to sing the song, somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time and prayed for me. But that was prayer in the present, in the here and now. Over a decade ago, I attended a minister's conference at Shaw University where the Reverend Dr. Cecilia Bryan out of the AME Church preached a sermon entitled, The Eyes of the Future Are Looking Back on Us, Praying We See Beyond Our Time, which I now know is an adaptation of a quote by Terry Tempest Williams. You are the cultural landscape of our nation and world, the impending effects of climate change, the trauma of collective families and communities, the pandemic, the economic crisis, all culminate in this moment of time in a very epic and astounding way. And wrapped in it is this prophetic call to recognize that our present will someday be someone else's past, that our future is someone else's present. It is this kind of connecting of time thing going on, this timeline of sorts that I believe if we can put our finger on it, even if we don't fully understand it, but if we can just touch a little bit, we might unveil some power we didn't know we had. So Moses knows he's about to die and God takes him up on Mount Nebo and it appears they continued on up to Mount Pisgah and God shows him the whole land far stretching and says, this is the land of which I swore to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I said to them, I will give it to your descendants. And then God says to Moses, I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's companion. Now, there's another song that we grew up saying, a song that says, Oh, ancient of days, your kingdom shall, as in future, reign over all the earth. Sing unto the ancient times long past of days. Despite the liberating and profound ways that we sing and proclaim about time, we have a strange and somewhat tenuous relationship with time. It is a reality, ironically, that um, we could explore endlessly and never fully cover it all. But I believe time shows up in this passage in a very interesting way. We won't cover it all, but I hope that we can get enough of a snippet to move us along in our age of time. We will just explore two points. First, time may be limited, but it is not necessarily scarce. 
During one of several racial equity and analysis trainings I have attended, the facilitators taught that time is a value to Eurocentric or dominant culture because in the past, harvesting, harvesting crops had to be done within a certain amount of time due to um, the distance that Europe is from the equator. There were fewer warm months, which meant fewer months to grow and harvest crops for food and livelihood. So from this lived experience, time became a cultural value. Fine. But when that experience or that specific um, experience with value is then forced into um, the value system of others, it's forced onto others, we have a different kind of problem. The value of time then got transferred to how a person, for example, should learn to the standard of what makes a good or smart student. Rather than a student, student knowing how to read and comprehend, students were expected to read so many words per minute in order to be considered fluent. They must comprehend quick enough to finish the test in a certain amount of time. The quicker, the better. But for students whose value base comes from a people who lived much closer to the equator, who could grow and harvest nearly year round, their value is invested in a different way, mainly in relationship, because communal trade and interaction was more prominent. We joke all the time, y'all, about CP time, but one facilitator pointed out that people of color may not always be on time, but we always in time. It is experientially and communally not individually and competitively that we base our value. But having a value like this forced on you creates a dissonance with time. When time is elevated in a way that is unhealthy in context where time should, be, should not be the major factor, then we start to constantly feel like there's never enough. And eventually we haven't hit the mark and we are not enough. It is very quietly and conspicuously um, a way that feeds to us the scarcity mentality that Pastor Mike was talking about a couple of weeks ago. And scarcity creates competition and competition or comparison creates isolation. It disrupts relationship and community. I recently read a quote that said, wasting someone's time may be the highest form of disrespect. And truthfully, our mortality does make time um, precious like there's a limited amount of land we can't make more or a limited amount of gold we can't make more and that makes those things precious greatly valued in contrast abundance often creates in humanity a lack of value those who have plenty are more likely to waste or take for granted or throw away whether they have whatever it is that they have in abundance but having something in abundance doesn't automatically mean that we have to waste nor that it loses value. And likewise, the temporal nature of time doesn't automatically mean that there isn't enough. And I think perhaps God is pointing us to this by asking us to change the way we think about our connection to time, our connection to how we think about things of the past and the future while in the present. So in our text today, Abraham is 120 years old, but the author is careful to note that he not only um, not only is he not um, impaired in any way by his sight, but that he still has all his vigor, his physical strength and health had not lessened despite his old age. Abraham did not feel like a man who was preparing to die, but he knew he was going to die. If we go back several chapters before, God tells him it's time. And then verse five of our passage today says that he died at the command of the Lord. But if we look at what God does before Moses dies, Moses goes up to the mountain and God says, this is the land which I swore to your forefathers, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over. Listen at what God is doing. God who is not bound by time, God for whom one day is like a thousand years, God who always has been and always will be, God in whose image we are created, speaks directly to a time continuum between the past, the present, and the future. God draws in essence a line across time, and that line across time is relationship. 
I promise um, this to your ancestors before you, and I'm fulfilling it for your descendants who will remain after you. Both the past and the future are connected to the present, not by fear of what didn't happen before, nor by the fear of what will happen in the future, but by the relationship of Moses to both his ancestors and his descendants. And further, this continuum across time was based on their relationship with God, the God of all creation, the God of abundance and life. You are, we spend so much time in the present rehashing pain and mistakes of the past or fearing and trying to control the future. And it binds us in the present. It keeps us from being free to behold the wonder of, of um, who we really are, the wonder of what our ancestors have bequeathed to us, the wonder of what we can bequeath to our descendants. What if God through this passage is inviting us to reorient our understanding of and connection to the limitation of time through the lens of relationship. What if here God is saying, though there may be temporal limitations that we as humans are bound to, that through our relational connections across time, we have the capacity right now to be impacted by the past, positively or negatively, and to impact the future, positively or negatively. That abundance isn't found in the amount of time we have, but in the relational connections we have throughout time and how we choose to use them, access them. But it's not just about whether or not I do all these things I believe I need to do in life, but rather what I do is an extension of what has come before me and it will be an extension um, further of what will come after me. The burden of achievement is not mine alone, but ours collectively across time. Now, all of a sudden, there's plenty of time to make mistakes, plenty of time to pause and heal, plenty of time to try to figure it out, plenty of time to work through a new strategy because the success, the success of um, call and purpose does not rest solely on us as individual, but it rests on all of us collectively across time, all of us bound together by a boundless God who is unfolding redemption. There's an African proverb that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone, but if you wanna go far, go together. We currently view time as a short game only. There are only some things that need an immediate and aggressive response in time right now, only some things. But viewing time through a relational connection to those before and after forces us to also, or in addition to the short term, live for the long game. This means that there is, that no matter how much or how little time we have, that amount of time is a part of a continuum of time that never stops, a part of eternity. And that takes us to our second point. Second, if this passage we are being called to engage, if in this passage we are being called to engage time through a relational lens, then this is also a call to accept the power that gives us. A colleague of mine shared an account um, from the autobiography of F.W. de Klerk, who was the president of apartheid South Africa, and he recounted sitting in meetings then with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was not only a key player in the end of apartheid, but also led the healing process afterward known as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And Desmond Tutu is well known even to this day for his disarming and infectious smile and laughter. Well, while in meetings, the clerk recounted that Tutu often broke out in laughter in the midst of very difficult and intense moments of conversation. And finally, the clerk asked Tutu why he laughs and smiles so much. And Tutu responded, because my friend, I know how this ends. In the chapters preceding 34, God not only warns Moses of his coming death, but he also warns Moses that the children of Israel will turn from God. In chapter 31, God says to Moses, soon you will lie down with your ancestors then this people will begin to prostitute themselves to the foreign gods in their midst and they will forsake me, breaking my covenant I have made with them. But it is what Moses does in response to this that's so intriguing to me, y'all. In chapter 32, Moses offers a song to the whole house to prophesy 
about what is to come. And then he says to them, take heed of my words and give them as a command to your children so they may diligently observe all the words of the law. This time continuum and relational connection keeps showing up. Moses is becoming an ancestor and commands that children, descendants, be given what they need to remain in relationship with God. But then in chapter 33, Moses does something else. Moses, despite knowing they will turn from God, offers a blessing, a prayer over the whole house of Israel. Go back and read it when you get a chance. The entire chapter is a blessing and a quite specific one. But this is what the ending says. There is none like God who rides through the heaven to our help. God subdues the ancient God, shatters the forces of old. God drove out the enemy before you in the past, and God is your shield. Your enemy shall come fawning to you, and you shall, future tense, tread on their backs. It is after this prayer, after this blessing, that Moses goes up to the mountain with God and God shows him the promised land. Moses is reassured of the fulfillment of the promise after he proclaims it in the blessing, not before. This means Moses in his prayer for them was saying, I know how this ends, even before he saw it. He's saying, um, this is my hope, my faith, my joy. It all remains intact because I know how this ends. Even if I never get to see it or live it myself, I know it and I will proclaim it. I will pray it, bestow it upon the descendants of my people. God actually allowing him to see it was a gift. But the prayer went forth before seeing this is powerful because it implies that the effect of our prayers, our work, our actions, our faith outlive us. That even if I die today, the impact and power of my prayers and work do not die with me, but are bestowed upon and bequeathed to my descendants. This means I can pray with certainty out of the truth that I know how this ends. Knowing how it ends changes everything. What you do now has an eternal impact in this time continuum between those who have come before you and those who will proceed after you. How is that not power? It is important to pray for the immediacy of the moment, yes. But here we see that we must also pray and give room for the prayers to extend the span of time of our earthly life. God answers prayers, hard stop. We don't get to dictate when. Can you hear God humming that tune? I'm an on time God. <laughs> God in this gives us a way to hold what feels like a delay in a way that reminds us that we are made for eternity. We have often considered eternity to only be like endless life after death. But perhaps this shift in relationship is moving us to the definition that eternity is also infinite or unending time. It is all that has come before and all that will be forever. We have the capacity for eternal impact. Now we may be better to understand why it is that what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. Keep praying. We know how this ends. Keep pressing. We know how this ends. Keep uplifting. We know how this ends. Keep loving. Keep trusting. Keep proclaiming. Keep imparting. We know how this ends. The arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Now, I must pause before we close and address very one real reality I have walked with and journeyed through my own process of loss and death and experiences and done so with others. Experiences that no matter how we look at it, death feels premature. Death that clearly says they didn't have time to inherit or pass on. They didn't have time. There is nothing I can say amid that kind of loss that will be sufficient. And I admit that shrouded in death is mystery. So much we don't know or understand, but I do offer alongside this reality something I discovered amid my own loss and amid the loss of too many to count, that if God's existence is eternal, always has been, always will be, and if God is love, 
then God's love does not end at the point of our mortal death. God does not stop loving us once we cross through that very thin veil, that very fragile veil between um, what we understand as life and death on earth. Love is an action verb. God is actively loving always without stop. That nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even death. If this is true, then the darkness and mystery of death is made of, or at the very least intertwined with, the substance of God's love. That perhaps the one you lost and your very experience of loss is engulfed in the love of God. And so, we blend the short, limited, and temporal nature of time with the eternal, never-ending nature of our God. It all becomes a part of eternity, and we become the answered prayer of not just our ancestors, but we become the answered prayers of the eyes of the future as we laugh in the face of evil and boldly proclaim, we know how this ends. Pray for your prayers, God.